Hello everybody, it's Vertical Sandwich. Welcome back to book reviews. I'm going to do this thing with my hair every single time. Every time we do book reviews, I'm just going to be like, my hair. Alright, now, today we're doing uh, this. Like, this, uh, it's hard to see. I've got sunlight coming in the window. and it's So, can you get, you got it? Here, this is The Wanderer by Fritz Lieber. Isn't this a cool looking book, by the way? It's just fantastic. Uh, so this is the, this is the winner from, uh, the Hugo Award winner from 1965. Uh, there are many stories of unexplained phenomena that begin with a moonlit face at a diamond pane window, or the baying of a hound in the darkest hours of the night. This one begins with an eclipse of the moon and a quartet of astronomical photographs showing star fields and a planetary object. Ruins of purest science at the opposite extreme from medieval superstition. And yet the young scientist who first saw the photos could not ignore the twinge of unease they caused him, the shivering sense of dread that for a moment made him kin to the most primitive caveman clinging in fear of the unknown. Passing along priority channels, the photographs arrived at the Los Angeles area headquarters of the American Moon Project, where even the experts who saw them, accustomed as they were to dealing with the inexplicable, felt the same sense of strangeness and unease. In the end, that which the photographs heralded would affect every atom of our planet, every human being on Earth, costing thousands their sanity and millions their lives. On the night of the lunar eclipse, Paul Hagbolt, a publicist with Project Moon, was on his way to the project's Vanderburg 2 base when he was persuaded to take a detour. His companion had seen a sign that read, This way to the Flying Saucer Symposium, and couldn't resist checking it out. So Paul found himself on a beach, surrounded by a diverse group of sky watchers, when the Wanderer first appeared in the heavens. Four times the diameter of the moon, streaming with its own eerily bloody and golden light, it seemed at first to be an atomic fireball, or the biggest flying saucer even the most ardent buff ever expected to see. The sheer impossibility of its existence, however, was belied by the ensuing massive earthquakes and the havoc caused by immense tidal surges around the world as the mysterious body systematically disintegrated and digested the moon. How could so vast a planet suddenly appear out of the void? Who or what controlled such awesome power? What possible defense could the people of Earth have against it? To his astonishment, Paul Hagbolt would be among the first humans to learn the incredible truth. Okay, literally, that's what this book is about. There's a bunch of people. It follows a bunch of people all over the the world, like, like a treasure hunter in Southeast Asia, the guy in Nigeria who's doing like a midnight uh, jet bombing on an imperial palace, um, a pair of lovers in New York City, and um, like a drunken Welsh guy, like a drunken Welsh poet, and all of these people on the night. That what happens is this spaceship the size of a planet just appears in the moon's orbit and starts consuming the moon like oh and, and an astronaut there's like there's there's an astronaut like on the moon at the time so uh from all those different points of view the novel kind of deals with that now there's one in 65 and it's an interesting transitional piece of work in my opinion at this point i've read 65 of 69 hugo award winners 64 of 69 hugo award winners I'm, 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 I'm in the middle of number 65. So, uh, and what, what I've noticed about kind of the transition of sci-fi is I talk a lot about magazine sci-fi in the 50s, right? And, and, and then I talk about how great the list in the 60s is. And this is plumb in the middle of the list in the 60s. And what you find is it reads like magazine sci-fi, but it's getting kind of braver and dirtier, right? Like, so... It's a little sexier, it's a little more violent, uh, it's a little, you know, it's, it's having fun with kind of the concepts, uh, it's, it's being very, uh, it's, it's not, it's, it's not taking itself kind of as seriously as a, an idea where, you know, stories have to be wrapped up like neat little packages, which is a thing I complain about a lot, is about, you know, doing somersaults for happy endings. This book does no somersaults for happy endings, it just goes, what if the moon was replaced by something much bigger? And the answer is cataclysm. Cataclysm. Like, these people start talking and they're like, well, if that thing is, like, bigger than the moon, 
then that means the tides will increase like by by a magnitude of like 80 and so then that proceeds to happen and things like that it's just it's amazing it's just amazing um and so and then you know like the the, the guy in the moon ends up on this planet uh which everybody's calling the wanderer and kind of learns about it and the one of the characters ends up getting abducted by a spacecraft with a, a very um full-sized uh Catwoman. She is uh, she's a feline woman. Um, he actually gets abducted with a house cat, and so there's this weird dynamic between like this Catwoman and an act like a pet cat, and then this guy. So like this juxtaposition of like what cats are like on our planet and what cats are like in outer space, and what people are like on our planet, what people are like. She keeps calling him the ape. Like it's and, and it, it, there's clearly a lot of fun. I genuinely enjoyed this, by the way. Like, if you can't tell, uh, I really liked kind of feeling that, 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 that step off. And so it was nice to read a book that kind of seemed to be at the forefront of that, that was making some very brave choices. Like, where somebody was going, okay, well, you know, magazine sci-fi, so, like, let's start making this stuff, you know, interesting and adult, instead of being, you know, uh, uh, um, John Carter of Mars. John Carter of Mars is, if you ever want to read what, what I'm talking about, like, kind of this, like, everything that I, I'm not a giant fan of, read the Edgar Rice Burroughs Carter of Mars stuff, because it's all that. It's all, like, one guy is just so super heroic that it's unbelievable, and then everything works out really well, and he becomes this kind of, like, this living legend to the people who, you know, your name precedes you, John Carter of Mars, like, it's just, uh, that kind of thing, and, and so it's nice to see somebody kind of, obviously living in that world, but going like, no, I think there should be sex, and I think that there should be the black, the black Dahlia killer, is he's in here, like, I think that stuff should be in there, like, I think that there should be violence, and there should be gangs of thugs, roaming the streets and killing cops because that's what it would be like and you're like yeah that's what it would be like um uh, and so there's it's interesting that it's it's almost more sci-fi than most sci-fi that came before it and yet has those haunting tinges of reality which is really where sci-fi comes into its own as a genre of literature it's not where it can be like this is the weirdest thing you've ever heard of it's where, hey, isn't this weird, but can't you believe it? Like, when that stuff happens, you just go like, oh, yeah, this is exactly, like, this is what San Francisco would look like if suddenly, you know, the tides were, you know, there were, yes, all the freeways would just stop and people would be out of their cars just, like, burning stuff. Like, that's what would happen. So, uh, let's read a little excerpt. By the way, this has pictures. It has... This is uh, the only other science fiction book besides Breakfast of Champions I've ever seen with like felt tip pen drawings in it. <laughs> that is the 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 color shading on the Wanderer as it as it rotates is cataloged in the book by one of the characters. It's, it's very clever. Like Lieber did an amazing job with this. It's really and so this book is uh, it's a little over three hundred pages and it reads fast. I mean it's. It's, it's big print, by the way. I mean, this is monstrously, you know. Um, and it's cool. Look, look at this book. This is great. So, Don Marion, Merriam is the, uh, is the astronaut on the moon. Don Merriam had been 15 minutes in the body of the moon, doing much of it at two miles a second. And now the violet and yellow thread, after widening to a ribbon, was staying the same width. Which couldn't be good, but there was nothing to do but bullet through it bullet toward it through the incredible flaw that split the moon along an almost perfect plane, like a diamond tapped just right. And nothing to be but one great piloting eye and suffer what thoughts to come that would, since he couldn't spare mind to control them. After the first big shove, he fired the main jets in brief bursts, aiming the Baba Yaga with the veneers. Don Merriam was making a trip through a planet's core. He had passed through its very center, and so far the trip had been glitter and blur and blackness, and a violet thread having a space screen turned milky in patches. 
that and an aching throat and smarting eyes and the picture of himself as a glass bee with a pr Prince Rupert's drop tail buzzing through a ripple and a stack of metal sheets miles long. Or an enchanted prince sprinting down a poisoned corridor wide as his elbows. To brush a wall, what a faux pas. Toward, toward mid-passage, there had been soot black streaks and a flash of green fire, but no guessing what made them. The meltiness in the space screen, at any rate, should be erosion from the fantastic thin-armed dust swirls that at one point had almost lost him the thread. He had lost the afterward sunlight, too, sooner than he'd hoped, and had to aim the Baba Yaga solely by the fainter purple and golden wall glimmers, and that was deceptive because the yellow was intrinsically brighter than the purple and tempted him to stay too far away from it. But now the violet ribbon began to narrow, and he knew it was the doom of him, worse than collision course, for there came unbidden to his mind a vision of the riven halves of the moon crashing together behind him, cutting off all sunlight, and then in ponderous reaction, and by the fierce mutual attraction of their masses, moving to crash together ahead of him, swinging through yards while he rocketed through miles, but swiftly enough to beat him to the impact point. Then, just as he seemed almost to reach it, just as by his rough gauging he'd moon traversed close to 2,000 miles, the violet ribbon blacked out altogether. And then, as incredible as if he'd found a life after death, he burst out of the blackness into light with stars showing off to all sides and even old shock-headed Sol shooting his blinding white arrows. Only then did he take in what lay straight ahead of him. It was a great round, as big as Earth seen from a two-hour orbit. This vast mounded disk was all radiantly violet and violet and golden to the right, where Saul lay beyond, but to the left inky black, save for three pale greenish oval glow spots curving off the disk in the distance. The unblurred night line between the radiant and the inky hemispheres was slowly drifting to the right as he watched just as Saul was slowly drifting towards the violet horizon. He realized that back there in the moon he had lost sight of the velvet ribbon, not because the jaws of the moon had clamped together, but simply because the night side of the planet ahead had moved over and looked down the chasm at him. He at once accepted the fact that it was a massive planet, and that the moon had gone into a tight orbit around it, because that alone, as far as he could reason, could explain the sights and happenings of the past three hours. The light deluging Earth's night side and the high light in the Atlantic and above all the shattering of Luna. Like, uh, just, just, like, Lieber's a great writer. He tells a really good story. It's a lot of fun. I really like this. It ages really well. Like, you read it, you go, well, some of it's a little 60s-ish. Like, the way women are kind of portrayed as, like, needing men and being kind of, hell, some of them. I mean, there actually are kind of aberrant characters, 250 stereotypes in here, and that's kind of nice. But it isn't so infused with, like, a counterculture vibe that you just go, oh, it's the future of the 70s. Um, no, it's, it's very much the future of the early 60s, uh, imagined with just one gigantic implausibility followed through to its end. Which is one of the things that works really well in science fiction. The city in the city does it amazingly. What if two cities share the same space? Boom, go. And you just run with it. Or what if suddenly a planet appears next to the moon? Boom, run with it. Uh, I loved it. I, I, I liked it a lot. It was a very good read. It's, it's great early sci-fi. Um, I would suggest you read it. Um, at being a, like again, again, this is out of the 60s list. The list that I talked to you about being almost flawless. And it is, there's one stinker in the bunch, I think, out of ten. So, yeah, The Wanderer by Fritz Lieber. Like, I strongly suggest it. I had a lot of fun with it. I think you would have a lot of fun with it. Uh, it's, it's not a heavy novel. You can pick this up and read it in a day or two. Um, probably two days. I mean, it's 300 pages. Who has time to read 300 pages in, you know, just a sitting? But uh, I think I read it in two days. So, yeah, I, 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 really, I really love the book. And um, I, I had a lot of fun with it. So when we come back next week, we will be talking about uh, some other Hugo Award winner. I have a pile of four of them next to me. 
so we'll be doing that. I will see you guys for that, and uh, you take care.